are starting a new series for this fall on Sunday mornings, and I just wanted to open up with a question, Uh, not a rhetorical question. I actually do want to hear from some of you. What's something that you have learned um, from the generations before you? Maybe from your mom or dad or from a grandparent or an older friend. What are some things you've learned from generations that have gone before? Just because you can doesn't mean you should. should. Wise words. (laughs) Going to church on Sundays. Yeah. Ann. Yeah, to be loving and giving. Yeah. English? Okay. My parents tried to teach me that. I don't know how well they did, but... um, Respect for your elders. Respect for your elders. Discipline. Discipline, yeah. Very good. My, My dad taught me how to change a car's oil. Um, he taught me about the importance of trusting God. Um, He modeled, as well as anyone I've ever met, the importance of being quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, as James says. My mom taught me about cooking and sewing and about the importance of putting others before yourself. Now, we can also learn what not to do from the people who went before us, right? When I watched my dad growing up, I realized that a a person probably doesn't need to keep a hundred used tires in the barn. That maybe storing a 38 Chevy bumper under your bed isn't the best way to woo your wife. Um, Maybe you decided to learn from your grandfather's anger your mother's bad financial habits, or your grandmother's tendency to gossip. And you said, you know, I'm not going to be like that. One of the beautiful things to me about the Bible is the realness with which it tells about those who went before, those, even those heroes of the faith. In Genesis, we read about the patriarchs. Abraham, or Abram, as he was known before God changed his name. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. But we also see a surprising amount, especially for that time, about the matriarchs as well. Sarah, or Sarai, Rebecca, Leah, Rachel, and many others. What we see among them are just shockingly real people. They have moments of great strength and faith and virtue, and they have moments where they don't. Well, these people are the ancestors of the nation of Israel, but they're also our spiritual ancestors as well. As Paul wrote to the church in Rome, therefore the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. So this fall, I want us to take some time to see what we can learn about relationships from our forefathers in the faith. As we look at these people, what what should we do? What should we not do as people of God and as his church? What does it mean to follow God in our families, in his church, as the family of faith? And in the middle of imperfect, faithful, messed up, beautiful and ugly people, because that's all of us, isn't it? So this first week, I'd like to turn to Genesis chapter 11, the very end of that chapter. Uh, If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn there, but the words will be up on the screen as well. I'm going to be reading Genesis 11, 27 through chapter 12, verse 1. And as, as we open God's Word together, as you're able, I invite you to stand.
This is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans, in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. May God add his blessing to this word. Please be seated. So what's happening here? Well, Abram and maybe Terah, we'll we'll get back to that in a minute, got a call from God. And the call came in their hometown of Ur, which was in what today is southern Iraq, um, kind of just below what uh, it has there with Babylonia written on the map. Ur was an ancient city, even at that time. It was known for a prominent temple that was there, a thousand years before Abraham's time. And its ziggurat, which was an ancient pyramid-like structure that was thought of as a stairway for the gods, it's still standing today. This is it. Both Tira and Abram and their family set out from Ur, heading for the land of Canaan. But did you notice they didn't obey completely. They stopped off along the way. Now, there was some intentionality in this, it seems, because Haran, if you notice, where they settled at the kind of top of the route there, was more than 80 miles out of their way. There was an ancient road that would have been a more direct route for them. But they went to Haran, and they stopped there. When you're walking more than 700 miles to go between two places, you usually don't accidentally add an extra week of walking onto your trip. Uh, Although you never know. Moses descended from these guys, and he spent 40 years just wandering around in the wilderness. Uh, I've heard it's because he really didn't listen to his wife and ask for directions, but um, there's some disagreement about that. What I find fascinating is that we know Abram got the call, but Tira is the one who's described as taking his family from Ur and heading out for Canaan. I wonder, had he received a call as well, but we aren't told about it because he didn't follow through completely? We can't know for sure, But it's clear that they were waylaid on their journey, and not just for a vacation, because we're told they settled in Haran. Well, this story about our spiritual forefathers has a powerful lesson for us as well, because God has called each one of us. Maybe you can say, yes, I've received a call from God. I've talked with people, including some who are in this room, who have heard God speaking to them, clear as day. Others have had powerful dreams that have directed them. Now, I've had times where I was praying and there was a voice responding, not audible, but not exactly my own thoughts either. I've had many more times where I knew God's leading, knew what He was calling me to do and the step that He was calling me to take. Now, I I need to say you have to be careful with any of this sort of 
voice from God thing. If you hear another voice in your head all the time, you probably ought to see somebody about that. And regardless, we need to test any voice like that. Does what we heard align with God's Word revealed in Scripture? If not, well, we can be pretty sure that's not of God. As Pastor Jeff pointed out this past Wednesday as he opened our study of Galatians, uh, which you can still join that for the the meal and our time of worship and prayer and, and study together at the North Olmstead campus, But anything, as he pointed out, even something that seems to be from an angel, if it goes against what we know of God and His will in Scripture, Paul says that messenger is accursed. But you know, there's another possibility when you think about a call from God. Maybe you haven't, don't feel that you've received any specific life direction from God. He's not called you to pack up and go as a missionary to some spiritually dark place like North Korea or Morocco or Michigan. I'm contractually obligated to make one Michigan joke a year, and with the start of football season, I figured I could get it out of the way and and we'll move on. Maybe you haven't sensed God's calling on your career or where you should live, or what, where you should go. But I want to tell you this morning, you have still received God's calling on your life. Jesus summed up God's law in this way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And Jesus forces us to admit that we can't do that. But he showed us that he could. And he stood in our place, taking on himself the punishment our sin deserves and giving us his life for all eternity. And as we live out that love that we have received, He tells us what we're supposed to be about, what we're supposed to do. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This calling is for every one of us. This command to follow Jesus, to love God and love our neighbor by making disciples of all nations for Him. And He doesn't want us to settle for anything else. So the lesson for us today is the title of the sermon. Keep walking. Don't settle for Haran when God has called you to the promised land. Don't stop halfway in your obedience. But what does that look like? How do we keep walking in our journey with God today? A few points occur to me from this passage. The first one of these is that our past and our present don't determine our future. God does. I don't know if you caught it, but there was a lot going on in Abraham's family. Did you notice some of those things? Anything stood out to you as we were reading through that section? What, what, do we, what was going on? Everybody's gotten bashful. Yeah, Sarah wasn't able to have, have children. And that, actually, that's a sign of, of tension there. There was... As far as we can tell, childlessness was the most common cause of divorce in the ancient world, being unable to have an heir and continue the family line. It brought shame on the whole family because it was seen as indicating that Sarai had angered a God 
and nobody wanted to be around somebody the gods were angry with. Anything else that you notice? Notice there have been challenges in their family. Tira had to bury his son before they even start out on their journey. And maybe you didn't catch it or not, but there's also just some, what we would see as some weirdness going on there. They really like to keep it in the family. Nahor married his own niece, and later we learn that Sarai is Abraham's half-sister. There's some odd things going on there. And we see as we look at their story, and if we're honest about our own, what's happened before does bring consequences. A conviction might make it harder to find a job. Poor financial decisions can haunt you and your family for years. And often, even things that aren't our fault carry consequences. Long-term illness or an unexpected death can strain resources and relationships. Studies show that people who grew up in a household without a father, as another example, are more likely to face abuse or neglect, are twice as likely to drop out of school, are more likely to commit crime and go to prison, have a four times greater risk of poverty, and are seven times more likely to become a teenage parent. But what we see from Abraham and his family is that God calls us out of our past and our present into something new. He called Abraham to leave behind his country and his people and his father's household. You know, in that culture at that time, those represented almost everything that defined a person, what gave them their identity. And they were all connected to deity, the national gods of their country, the clan gods of their people, and the household gods or ancestors that they had to appease. But God tells Abraham, leave all of that behind. Find your sufficiency, find your identity in me alone, not in any other God, any other family, any place. And God gave Abraham a promise for the future. He continues on in Genesis 12, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Our past and our present don't determine our future. God does. Another thing that occurs to me as we're looking at this passage is that true obedience requires death. Abraham received his call in Ur, but notice that it was only after the death of Terah that he continued to follow God's calling. And you know, we actually see this a lot in the pages of Scripture. It's only after the death of Moses that Joshua could lead the nation of Israel into the promised land. It's only after the death of Saul that David could become king. It's only after the death of Herod that Joseph could take Mary and Jesus back to Nazareth. It's only after the death of Stephen that the church fulfilled Jesus' call to be witnesses beyond Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, I don't mean to get morbid, but often you see someone with an elderly parent or someone with a terminal illness, and their life is on hold until that person dies. Now, that kind of caregiving is a powerful and important ministry. But sometimes people can use somebody else's life as an excuse for not following God's calling on their own life. Jesus called a man once and said to him, follow me. 
But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, Jewish custom said that you had to bury a person on the day they died. So it's not likely that this man was visiting Jesus between his father's death and the funeral. His father is still alive. The man is saying, I'll follow follow you, Jesus, but I want to wait until after my father is gone. And Jesus says, no, don't wait to follow me. I need to come first. Last November, several of us on staff attended a one-day conference for pastors that was put on by our denomination. The speaker was Dr. Christopher Yuen, who has a powerful ministry speaking around the nation uh, about holy sexuality, drawing from his own life experiences about how to approach God's calling on our gender and sexuality with grace and love. A couple of years ago, he put his travels on hold when his father became ill. But he told us that after a month or so, his father realized that Christopher wasn't going out to any conferences or engagements. And he asked Christopher if it was because of his illness. Christopher admitted it was. His dad got angry with him. You can't stop your calling just waiting for me to die, he said. Your message is too important. You need to start traveling again. Go and proclaim the kingdom of God. But it's not just about waiting on somebody else's life. For me to truly obey God, I need to die. As Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. If we've placed our trust in Jesus, we have accepted his death and his resurrection on our behalf. We have died in him. It's part of the powerful symbolism of baptism. So he calls us to put to death what has defined us and accept the life he gives us. We should live for him following him as he calls. So it's God who determines our future. And true obedience requires death. But finally, we need to challenge one another to follow God. Abraham wasn't following God's calling alone. He was with Terah and Sarah and Lot And we get plenty of hints along the way that there were others too. But they all just went along with settling in Haran. At yesterday's men's breakfast over in North Olmsted, one man who was there shared about the opportunities God had given him to get to know a couple of co-workers, to get a bit deeper in those conversations occasionally touching on matters of faith, but but not going much further. And he said that he knew God was calling him to take a step of faith, to offer to pray with them, to be more direct about what it meant for him to follow Jesus and to move toward inviting them to do so. He felt that God had given him some opportunities in that, but he'd been reluctant to step out in those moments. And he asked us to pray that he would have boldness to speak. And there were a couple of other men there who tried to encourage him by saying, you know, I'm sure you're having an influence by the way that you live. You're having an impact even without opening your mouth. And the man responded politely, but I could hear the emotion in his voice. Thank you, 
But that's not what I need right now. This is about obedience. Ginger and I have been part of small groups where people tried to be encouraging, thinking they were easing our guilt. You're doing the best you can. Nobody's perfect. God can use you right where you are. I'm sure you can serve God in Haran just as much as you could in Canaan. There may be some truth in those statements, but for us, it wasn't about human guilt. It was about obedience to God's will, to His call. And instead of truly helping us, they were actually quenching the conviction of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Because I don't need to feel better. I need to follow Jesus better. As the people of God, we need to be people who won't let one another settle in Haran. We need to be people who will challenge one another to keep walking into God's call. We need to be people who will tell one another, you know, don't stop when it gets tough. And it will get tough. God told Abraham that people might curse him, but he would become a blessing anyway. And following Jesus will be tough for us. He told his followers, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Following Jesus will feel like real work at times. But Paul reminded the churches of Galatia, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time... There we go. (laughs) For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. We need to be people who tell one another, don't stop when it gets tough. And we need to be people who tell one another, don't stop when you get comfortable. The Apostle John wrote, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. And you know, there could be a temptation for us right here to say that, you know, we're forming a great little community here at Illyria Friends. God has done some great things in our midst. It's nice to be small where you can get to know everybody. But you know, there is a whole city and a whole county out there full of people who don't know Jesus or who have drifted away from Him. People who need community and salvation and hope. God's not done yet. But am I? Are you? We need to remind one another, don't stop when you get comfortable because God has greater things waiting for you. And we need to be people who tell one another, it's never too late to start again. Abraham waited a long time before leaving Haran. He waited until after Terah died and the guy lived to be 205 By that point, we're told Abraham was 75 years old. Now, I'll admit, I don't know exactly what to do with 205-year-old men. It's possible they counted ages a little differently at that time. But the point stands regardless. Abraham waited a long time. He was past his prime. But it wasn't too late for him to follow his calling. He picked up from Haran, and he kept walking, as God had told him to. Maybe you've ignored God's call for a long time. 
Maybe you've never actually given your life to Him, telling yourself you could always do it later, that going to church is enough. Or maybe God called you to step out in faith, but you didn't do it. Or you started to, but then you got distracted or tired or scared and you settled for something else. We need to be a people as the church of Jesus Christ who will tell one another, I know you've settled. I know you've stepped away from what God is calling you to do, but it's not too late. Get up. Go. Because God doesn't call us to follow Him alone. So today, do you feel held back by your past or by the circumstances of your present? Hear this morning that God is the one who calls you into His future for you. It's not going to be easy because true obedience requires death. But Jesus will give us His life. So let's be people who challenge one another toward obedience. Who don't quench the conviction of the Holy Spirit, but who remind one another, don't stop when it gets tough. Don't stop when you start to get comfortable. It's never too late to start again. Keep walking because He is faithful. Keep walking because He is worth it. Keep walking because the world needs to know. Keep walking.